The Gospel of Matthew says, if anybody slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. Hmm. Uh, Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Just something we've got to talk about. Brittany Griner currently being imprisoned in Russia. Uh, allegations of racial discrimination at Tesla and the U.S. bill to cap the cost of insulin prices at $35 a month. These are things that make you just go. Hi, this is Dr. Michelle, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Tab Talks. And boy, do we have a lot to cover. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Everyone in the world is talking about the slap that Will Smith gave to Chris Rock on live television on the Oscars. And let's just kind of take a look at that eye-dropping moment for any of you who didn't see that. Okay, now, while everybody was focused on what happened between the two of them, Let's take a look at the clip that's gone viral regarding Jada's reaction. Here, she can be seen laughing at the violence that everyone witnessed, uh, initially thinking it was part of the script. Uh, it was not part of the script. And I know when I watched it, I thought it was part of the script. But then when he starts to yell those expletives, and I don't even want to repeat that here, people soon saw that there was something wrong with him that this was not a joke. So initially when Chris Rock tells his joke, you know, Smith laughs. He's laughing. And here you can see him laughing until Jada gives him the, are you going to let him say that about me look? So then Will, of course, feeling emasculated, and this is kind of not the first time that he's felt emasculated, feels that he has to get up and do something. So Okay, so what's gotten us to this point? Well, in 2021, Smith wrote a memoir and it was entitled Will. And in this book, he speaks about having a history of depression, uh, struggling in his marriage, trying to cope in a marriage that quite frankly has been publicly described as open. And at one point even having suicidal ideations. Will Smith, yes. Uh, Will also talked about his relationship with his father, saying that there was a point in his life where he actually wanted to kill his father because he was abusive and he was an alcoholic. And he talks about, you know, his own drug use and challenges with substance abuse. So I think all of us Will Smith fans were in shock by what we witnessed. And I know my mind kind of went back to the days of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I mean, Fresh Prince would have never, ever, ever done that. So I think that was so shocking to everybody. But I think what was most admirable about the, the entire incident is how Chris Rock reacted. I mean, besides being able to take an extremely hard hit to his jaw, I mean, because you really didn't see him flinch, he maintained his composure, you know, actually showing more concern for Will than anger. I think you saw empathy, you saw shock, you saw, wow, something's going on with you. And there are published reports that he could have filed charges because the LA police, someone called them and they were on the scene to ask him if he wanted to press charges, but he chose not to. So just imagine for a moment, the Los Angeles police coming into the Oscars, taking Will Smith out of the audience, booking him, and him not receiving his Oscar because he's in jail. So I think I have to applaud Chris Rock because he understood the dynamic of not wanting to see that and not wanting to do that. I think Chris also understood that men of color have not always been portrayed favorably in Hollywood. And he didn't want to contribute to yet another stereotype of black men being handcuffed and being taken to jail. So I think we have to applaud Chris. Now, regrettably, we think that money and fame shield you from real life problems, and they don't. There's been research by Carolyn Gregor that talks about how money influences how you feel and how you think. And specifically, she found in general that upper class people tend to demonstrate less empathy 
and less moral judgment. In fact, they talk about wealth actually leads to moral entitlement. The University of Berkeley did several studies that demonstrates the affinity of the wealthy to engage in behavior that supports the belief that the rules don't apply to them. Had anyone else come out of that audience and punched Critch Rock? Well, we already know the answer to that. Uh, the police would have been called and the person would have been arrested. So I guess that just goes to show you, like in the words of Biggie Smalls, more money, more problems. Hey, I don't know about everybody else, but I certainly want to give a big whoa to watching the confirmation hearings with Katanji Brown Jackson. Now, legislators felt that it was fair game uh, and they brought it with some really tough questions about abortion to critical race theory and her sentencing record. And I think that she demonstrated such poise and candor that really commanded attention. You know, as the first African-American woman nominee for the highest court in the land in its 232 year history, mind you, and also the second working mother to be confirmed, uh, Judge Jackson has just had a stellar career as a federal court judge. I can remember the day that she was grilled about her sentencing record on individuals accused of child pornography. For every defendant who comes before me and who suggests, as they often do, that they're just a looker, that these crimes don't really matter, they've collected these things on the internet and it's fine, I tell them about the victim statement that have come in to me as a judge. I tell them about the adults who were former child sex abuse victims who tell me that they will never have a normal adult relationship because of this abuse. I say to them that there's only a market for this kind of material because there are lookers that you are contributing to child sex abuse. And then I impose a significant sentence and all of the additional restraints that are available in the law. These people are looking at 20, 30, 40 years of supervision. They can't use their computers in a normal way for decades. I am imposing all of those constraints because I understand how significant, how damaging, how horrible this crime is. She reminded them over and over again that the structure of the court allows a federal judge maximum discretion when it comes to sentencing. If there's no consistency in sentencing, it's because the law allows federal judges to use their discretion in these type of cases. So if legislators have a problem with her use of discretion, then change the federal sentencing guidelines and change the system. You can't punish her for a system that she did not create. And I don't know about anyone else, but the coverage that went on and on about how her husband loved her and, you know, was a bit much as though he wasn't supposed to love her, that loving her was unusual in some way. And I don't know that I've ever seen so much emphasis on the spouse and the relationship during a Supreme Court justice confirmation hearing, basically to suggest that biracial marriage is an anomaly. It's just simply not true. I think what I find most interesting and just amazing about the Honorable Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is that she is a beautiful Black woman wearing a culturally specific hairstyle. And I think that that challenges every critique of women of color that we've had to deal with for decades when we wear natural hair or when we wear braids. I think this will definitely be a whoa moment in history when she is seated. And I'll be watching, and I hope all of you will too. Now, next we move on to uh, the case of two-time Olympic gold medalist and WNBA phenom basketball star Brittany Griner. If anyone has been following this story, Ms. Griner was detained in Russia on charges that she was attempting to smuggle drugs out of their country. 
and apparently the customs agent found vape cartridges containing cannabis oil. That is what's being reported. Let's check out some footage of her luggage being searched at the Moscow airport. This all-star athlete who has been featured all over the world as the face of women's basketball is now pictured like this, a mugshot. Now, I've talked to quite a few people about this and I've heard quite a few opinions. Some have been pretty harsh. And, and while I agree that when you're in someone else's country and you're traveling abroad, you have to obey the laws of that country, I don't agree that she deserves what happened to her because she's in Russia. I think that people should have the right to pursue their dreams and their goals. I believe that people have the ability to recognize their opportunities in a global economy. And so I don't begrudge that she followed her dreams. And this was the off season for the WNBA where she plays on a team in Russia. What this all basically comes down is, do is dollars and cents. Griner has hit the salary cap for the WNBA, and that's about $200,000. Now, if you add endorsements, uh, she's probably getting upwards of probably no more than $500,000. However, in Russia, in the Premier League, she's paid $1 million per season. So athletes like Griner are enticed to play in these leagues for more money. Now, you, you may ask yourself, is it worth it? Because now she's looking at a potential to serve 10 years in a Russian jail if she is convicted. And uh, she's been in Russia since February and they keep saying, well, you know, she may be eligible for bail sometime in May, but a court date has not been set for her. And there is a saying that all money is not good money. And I hope this is not a hard lesson that Ms. Greiner has to learn because regrettably there are two many examples of Americans being detained in foreign countries and not having good outcomes. And the fact that there is a war raging between Russia and Ukraine, I think complicates this case even more. There are other American detainees in Russia, both of which have been there for several years. So let's just pray this is not Ms. Griner's outcome. This case will definitely make you go, whoa. Okay, let's move on to what's going on with Tesla. I just love those cars, but the state of California, Department of Fair Employment and Housing has filed a racial discrimination lawsuit against the car maker Tesla. Uh, apparently employees have characterized the work environment being like a slave ship, claiming that their employer has done nothing to address continued racial harassment that they've been experiencing for years. So from a lack of promotions to being given the most physically challenging and dirty work in the plant, African-Americans went to the state of California and said, look, you're gonna have to step in and investigate. And apparently the California Department of Fair Employment has been investigating Tesla for the past three years culminating into a formal lawsuit being filed. So this is the state employment uh, department filing against Tesla. So employees talked of regular use of racial slurs, photos of nooses, being treated like second-class citizens. And we're not just talking about a few complaints, we're talking about hundreds of complaints. The official complaints spoke about daily exposure to racist symbols and language, as well as employees actually being separated and segregated on the workroom floors within the company and African-Americans being disciplined more aggressively and then retaliated against for complaining. So how has Tesla responded? Well, they posted on their blog that they've been working with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing for years 
and have successfully closed out 50 cases. So they have defined and basically put out a statement that the suit is misguided. Well, the Department of <laughs> California Employment got really angry, I guess, by that response. And they said that they have issued several rights to sue letters to employees suggesting that Tesla's spin is misguided. So for those who are still not sure about Tesla, their CEO, owner Elon Musk, and I think we got a picture of him here, is one of the richest men in the world. And there was a report that he was scheduled to visit the plant and the Black people were asked to move to the back during his visit. That's what's being reported. Now, what's so interesting about this is that in October of 2021, Elon Musk announced that he was closing um, the operations in California, which had always been their corporate seat, and that he was moving to Austin, Texas. And it was also reported that the top executives in the California base weren't aware of this move. So I don't know about you, but timing is interesting. Here's a promo piece that was published explaining why Tesla is moving out of California. Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has relocated from California to Texas, United States, as per reports. Musk reportedly made the move to avoid heavy taxes in California compared to no income tax in Texas. During an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Musk said that California has taken innovators for granted. The relocation also makes sense as both Tesla's new factory and SpaceX operations are located in Texas. Earlier this year, Musk had reportedly got into a spat with county officials in California over Tesla's San Francisco Bay Area factory being asked to stay closed due to the COVID-19 restrictions. After which, Musk had threatened to move Tesla's Palo Alto, California headquarters to Texas. Tesla stocks have seen substantial increase in value this year, rising more than 600%. Tesla shares closed at $649.88, up by 1.3% on December 8th itself. The company is also prepared to roll out its new Cybertruck electric pickup sometime next year. Moreover, the company has to finance some big-ticket capital spending in 2020 for its new factory in Germany and outside of Austin. The company posted a USD $331 million net profit for the July through September period, its fifth straight quarter of profitability. Chances are Tesla could post its first full-year profit when it reports its fourth quarter earnings in early 2021. Hence, the current move makes sense for Elon Musk. Elon Musk isn't the only celebrity status person who has left the state of California due to heavy taxation and regulations. In recent years, there have been several reported cases of celebrities exiting the state and moving to more freedom-friendly Texas. I also don't know if a lot of us knew, I know I didn't know, that in October of 2021, a jury awarded a former African-American employee who was an elevator operator, $130 million in damages. A U.S. federal jury has ordered Tesla to pay over $130 million in damages to a black former employee. That is according to the Wall Street Journal. It says the jury found that Owen Diaz was subjected to a racially hostile workplace. He was an elevator operator who worked at the company's factory in Fremont, California. The jury reportedly also found that Tesla failed to take any steps to protect Diaz from harassment. In a statement, the firm said the facts did not justify the verdict, but conceded that its record at the time of Diaz's employment was not perfect. Before the trial began, the presiding judge rejected efforts by Tesla to exclude one juror, saying he believed the attempt was based on race. 
Last year, the electric car maker disclosed in its first diversity report that black employees make up only 4% of its U.S. leadership positions and 10% of its total workforce in the country. And I don't know about you, but I didn't even think we still had black elevator operators. But anyway, this employee was saying that he was harassed daily from his co-workers, basically telling him to go back to Africa. Well, guess what, Tesla? He can not only go to Africa, he can pretty much go anywhere in the world he wants to with that kind of award. And so that is something that definitely makes me want to say, whoa. Well, it's always exciting to know when the government is working for the people. So let's talk about drugs, you know, uh, and Congress finally taking a stand on the cost of insulin. Uh, recently, the House voted on a bill to actually cap the cost of insulin. Can you believe that? To actually cap it to $35 per month, citing that it takes only a few dollars to produce. It's estimated that 34 million Americans. 10% of the population have diabetes, including more than 1.5 million who have type 1 diabetes, requiring daily doses of incidence in varying quantities. Remember, all of this stress, hardship, suffering, and sacrifice is due to a drug that costs just a few bucks to make. One study found that Americans pay 10 times as much as other countries for insulin. These price increases are about companies looking to maximize profits and nobody standing up for the patients. Nobody with the power to do something about it. It's enough, enough. Nobody has held the manufacturers, the manufacturers accountable until now. My Build Back Better bill takes three key steps to lower the cost for families dealing with diabetes. First, we're gonna cap cost sharing of, for insulin at $35 per month. That means you can't get charged more than 35 bucks at a pharmacy counter for your insulin. That's across the board. Whether you get health insurance through your private policy, the Affordable Care Act marketplace, or through Medicaid, nobody is going to pay more than $35 for each month for insulin. So what got us here? Well, I'm going to show you this analysis, to show you what got us here. And what's so outrageous is that a single vial of insulin to produce is only $6, but consumers are having to pay upwards of $250 per vial. And that's an astronomical profit margin uh, that people are just saying, how are these drug companies able to get away with that? Well, let's look at how we compare with other countries and then it'll just make you even angrier when you see how big that profit margin is. I don't know about you, but if you can see these differences in the cost and the price, I mean, the United States is in the stratosphere in comparison to other countries. And according to Statistica's research, the cost differential is attributed to American pharmaceutical companies being able to set whatever price they want to. You know, this is a capitalistic society and they can charge whatever they want. And there's basically no competition healthy competition in the U.S. for insulin makers. So you have them pretty much a monopoly and they can charge what they want. And when you have those two variables together, that's why you see a chart that looks like this. And some of you are probably asking, why is this an issue for Black America? Well, it's an issue for Black citizens because if you have, say, type 1 diabetes, you then have to understand that race and economic status matters in the healthcare system. And it's not right, but there are so many indicators that support that those variables do matter. And when you have a life-saving drug that many people can't afford, there are negative outcomes. I found this interesting poll that was taken by the Beyond Type 1 app, actually asking about 500 participants who had type 1 diabetes, if they had ever rationed their insulin, and 30% said yes. People are dying from making these kind of decisions. Let's check out one story. I'm Sandra Dion Johnson, and I was duly diagnosed with 
congestive heart failure and type 2 diabetes. But I've been very lucky. I've been able to get treatment and live with it. I'm on two different kinds of insulin and I'm on a non-insulin medicine for my diabetes. I'm on eight different medicines for my heart and related things. Over the course of the time that I've been taking them, the prices just have become prohibitive. Okay. Yeah. It's only us folks in that middle ground. We're too rich to be poor. We're too poor to, you know, be okay. We fall through the cracks. Sandra? Yeah. It's like a full-time job. Your job becomes managing your health. Hi, I'm Dr. I work with Dr. Fish. Okay. And I understand in the past you've had some struggles with kind of insurance. Yes. But you so. haven't been on the Victoza for how long now? Oh, for a couple months, maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Test strips are expensive. The lance lancets are expensive. Yeah. Yes. I prioritize the heart stuff over the insulin because. <laughs> The heart stuff is more immediate. I know over time, diabetes will kill me, but it'll take a longer time. And I know that without the heart failure drugs, I only have 13% function of my heart. I don't want to play with that. Okay, that's nice and clear. Yeah. I don't like the stress of thinking about how I'm going to pay for my meds. You know, how's it going to, because I'm never going to have any, more money or any less money. So I'm never gonna qualify for extra help. Afternoon, this one will have the syringes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place, and I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. Uh, there can be an impact to your eyesight, your energy levels, your decreased ability for wounds to heal, uncontrolled blood pressure, and kidney damage. So when you look at a 25 year history of chronic kidney disease, this is definitely something that makes you go, whoa. Uh, and one person kind of posted on Reddit very simply that America, we're just getting older and we're getting fatter. But aside from that, I think when you look at the number of individuals, African-American citizens who are impacted in a favorable way by Congress stepping in, I just have to applaud them because believe me, it's not a coincidence that you're starting to see renal dialysis centers on every corner in the black community. We used to say chicken, churches, and drive-throughs were on every corner in the minority community. And now we can add dialysis centers to that list. I wonder what would happen if we put fresh fruit and vegetables and workout centers on those corners instead of being committed to so many dialysis centers, I think we would be focused on a wellness model and not the sickness model that we seem to say will react to health concerns after people are sick instead of intervening before they do. And hats off to our lawmakers for taking this critical step to changing the lives of millions and millions of people. That to me, is something to say, whoa, whoa, whoa.